All right. Uh, okay, before we go to photography, I'm going to take this quick question. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Good evening, Dr. Book. This is Skylar. Hey, Skylar. You've got a question on topic because uh, I've got a lot to cover in yeah, minus so five minutes. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, just like you, you're you going to mention uh, Dunkirk, um, I have a question about how photography and film work. See, in D Dunkirk, it's actual events, or it's depiction of real people. And is that different from a photograph? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 so I consider movies to be the most complex art form there is. I mean, think about it. Movies entail not only um, acting, which is a selective recreation of reality, and Ayn Rand defined art as a selective recreation of reality based on an artist's meta metaphysical value judgments, and I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but, but you've got acting, which qualifies as, as art. You've got um, a story. You've, so you've got a script. You've got drama, which qualifies as art. You've got photography and direction, and and you've got all the and you've got music right music is is odd so you've got all these elements and they all have to be integrated into one aesthetic experience photography most photography is very different from that it's static it's you're taking a picture of something that is not recreated it just is if you think about a movie all the sets in Dunkirk were recreated there isn't a Dunkirk, not in the way there was in 1940, no, 1939. Not in the way there was in 1939. Mm -hmm. You had to recreate it, and you had to recreate a set. You, you had to bring actors there who don't just live there. You had to put them in uniforms, which they don't usually just have. So the difference between photography and movies is vast. Photography is just one little element within a vast art form called film, which includes all these other elements in addition to the photog photographic aspect of it. And, of course, movies can be less or more artistic in, in whether they stylize that visual experience more or less. In other words, whether the visual experience is re a recreation versus just accepting the way the world looks and just filming it. So and that that would be a, a pure naturalism, a realism. Uh, uh, there's a whole school of movies uh, of a film called realism, and and it just just films it the way it is. So they, there's no attempt to to to, to recreate uh, in to, to shape the world that's being filmed. Um, you have to go back to Fritz Lang's old movies where the sets were actually painted and drawn. So so the world in which the action happened was actually recreated. Or, or even to Hitchcock, who uh, in his films, every little piece of furniture where every little thing was on the set was completely purposeful and, and, and intentional and thought about. And, and that, that's great art. That's, that's, you know, that's true art when you actually recreate it. So let me, let me, let me get into photography now. You, you got it, Skylar? We good? Yes, sir. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. All right. Um, so, photography, traditional photography, I don't think is art. And, and the reason is what I just said. It, it doesn't involve recreation. It involves things as they are, period. Um, it, it, it's taking a picture of reality th that's out there. And Ayn Rand did not consider photography art. Now, it, it can be aesthetic. It can be pretty. It can be beautiful. But in a sense of recreating metaphysical value judgments and everything that entails. And, and when something recreates value judgments, it has an impact on you as a viewer because it condenses certain ideas, certain views of the world for you and you respond to those. That's the kind of unique aesthetic experience we get. We're responding to the artist's metaphysical value judgments, even when we don't identify them. This is, again, related to the emotion. Our emotions are automatically giving us back, a, a, a producing a response to what they're seeing in our artwork, to what, to what our subconscious is reading in the artwork, as 
the values that are, that have been recreated there. Photography doesn't really do that. And when it does it, it does it on a shallow level. Now, the reason I brought this up is that somebody asked, well, what about photography in the modern world where you take a photo and then you completely manipulate it using Photoshop, using the million different software programs that are available today. And you can actually change what you photographed. Now, let me say my caveat about anything I talk about when it comes to aesthetics. I'm not an expert, and and this is just some preliminary thinking, and don't take this as the objectivist view because this is not Ayn Rand's view. This is Yaron, to the best of his ability, telling you what I think is consistent with the philosophy of objectivism in its view of aesthetics. I would say that to the extent that those photographs are manipulated purposefully and systematically in ways, in ways that are projecting a particular view that the artist has, usually subconscious view. It's usually, art does not usually reflect necessarily the conscious views of, you know, some artists are very well integrated, so they're conscious and subconscious, but usually what's, what you're given is a subconscious view. Um, to the extent that it's what Ayn Rand called a metaphysical mirror, right, of the artist. So the artist is putting down, and it's purposeful, and it's thoughtful, and it uh, really does manipulate the image. But not just randomly, not like the software you have on your iPhone where you take, a, you take a photo and then you press a button and it scribbles it all up. That's not art. Or that, that's the equivalent of modern non-art, right? So yes, I, I think it can be. That's my tenet. But, but I haven't seen any that is. I've seen beautiful, beautiful images. I've seen, I've seen photographs that I would hang up on the wall that, 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 that are just gorgeous. But I haven't seen any... Re- I can't say I've seen photographs that I would describe as art. Now, I've seen photographs where I thought it was a painting. Maybe that's the closest it comes. Because of the qualities of the photograph. Because of the way it was touched up. Because of the way everything was positioned because of the way the artist did whatever it did in Photoshop, that it looks like a painting. Yeah, no, I can see that. But again, it's tricky, right? It's tricky. Um, so I, I think it can be. Uh, it's at the margin. And most photography is 99.9% of photographs people take. 0.9999 are not out. A few artists might exist out there who can manipulate a photograph and make it an artwork. That's the best formulation I can come up with. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'm looking at the... Uh, all right, uh, so, so on, on YouTube, it seems like they have the most random conversations. So they're talking about Tommy Lahren and Ben Shapiro on, um, on YouTube. I don't know why they're listening to my podcast. Uh, and on Blog Talk, um, can't uh, can't see uh, can't see anything relevant to those questions. All right, so unless somebody has a question, I'm going to go on to talk about Dunkirk. But before that, I am going to take a quick uh, commercial break, and uh, and then we'll be back. 2017 marks the 60th anniversary of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Twelve years in the writing, it is Ayn Rand's masterwork. Despite being published six decades ago, the novel continues to gain recognition and profoundly influence business leaders, thought leaders, and a growing number of political leaders. Its presence in today's culture cannot be denied. The fascination with Atlas Shrugged persists because it grapples with the fundamental questions of human existence and presents radically new answers. Whether you're an adoring fan who wants to add this new addition to your personal library or someone who wants to read the book for the first time to see what all the fuss is about, pick up your copy of Atlas Shrugged today. An updated cover for the mass market edition of the novel recently hit stores. Check it out. You can order your copy today on Amazon. All right, so uh, let's talk about Dunkirk. I saw the movie a week ago, and um, I don't know. I assume everybody knows the story of Dunkirk. It's it's a true story, uh, and the film is is portraying a true story. Uh, and the true story is is that uh, in World War II, 
uh, as the Germans swept through, uh, invaded France, swept through Belgium and, and the rest of Northern Europe, um, they cornered, uh, I think it was 400,000 French and British troops on a small uh, beach called Dunkirk. And um, if the Germans had managed to wipe out those troops, capture them or kill them, that would have caused the Allies, the, the French and the British, it set them back years in terms of their ability to mount an offensive against the Germans. Who knows what would have happened if for the rest of World War II. Um, you know, many of the, the troops on that, uh, on that beach who were ultimately saved came back and D-Day and fought the Germans and, and pushed them back. It would have been a, emotionally, it would have been a devastating, devastating loss for the Brits in particular. And it could have very well emboldened Hitler to try to cross the canal and invade, uh, and invade uh, Great Britain. Uh, and uh, that was the real danger, is that if, if he'd captured or killed the, the, all those British troops in Dunkirk, uh, he would have probably felt, and, and felt free to just cross the canal and, and try to invade Britain. And indeed, the British knew this. So the British held back from trying to rescue their people. They held back much of their air force, and held back much of their navy. They were worried. They were worried that if they engaged the navy and the air force in the battle over Dunkirk, that uh, and in the end the Germans would wipe out their soldiers and they would they would destroy many of their uh, planes and, and many of their ships. That they would be defenseless uh, when the Germans actually tried to invade uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, so, indeed, not only were these hundreds of thousands of troops abandoned uh, were, were on, these, on this beach, they were under constant aerial attack from German fighters. They were under constant bombardment from artillery positions not that far away. They were in, within artillery range. And very few Navy ships, no Navy ships could come close enough to actually pick up these soldiers. So they, there was one place where you could load soldiers up onto the ship, but that was quickly bombed by the Germans, so you couldn't even do that. Uh, so there was no way for the big ships to come in close enough, so they would have to send rowing ships, rowing boats, and it was a slow, cumbersome process. But in addition, the British Navy did not was not willing to dedicate enough ships uh, to do this. Um, the way in which these troops were ultimately saved was that they, there was a call uh, the Navy basically used a, um, I guess, a provision that they had where they, they took over uh, civilian boats. And so they, they, they went to, uh, to and, and uh, basically confiscated civilian boats, small boats, and sailed them towards the coast. But what happened was that uh, even boats that were not commissioned by the Navy, uh, boats and most of the boats that landed up sailing were, were sailed by civilians, non-commissioned by the Navy, and just people voluntarily got in their boats, and sailed to Dunkirk. Uh, I think the British citizens realized that their future, that their lives, that everything they cherished was at stake and that they, that they needed to do something, that this was a time for action. Real heroism, uh, heroism for a good cause, for the cause of, of defending liberty and defending freedom. Uh, so thousands of little boats sailed across the British Channel, could get very close to the shore, loaded up soldiers, and sailed back. And it was one of the greatest rescue missions in human history, maybe the greatest. Uh, they, they got 300,000 British troops off of, off of the shores of Dunkirk. All right, that's the story. That's what happened. Um, the movie uh, is, um, uh, is in the theaters right now. It's uh, So let me just say... It was, it was an incredible, it's an incredibly, um, it's an incredibly made movie. It's, it's made by Christopher Nolan, who made the Batman movies. Um, now, again, I'm not an expert on film. I'm not an expert on aesthetics. But I think this is an incredibly well-integrated movie. The music, the cinematography, the acting, the storyline. He has three storylines. And there's a twist in the end in terms of how those three storylines integrate 
and they all do integrate in the end. And it takes you a little bit of a while to catch on to what's exactly happening, but it makes it interesting. It's intense. You, you literally, my, my wife, at the, when we, as we movie ended, she said, let's go home and get in the jacuzzi. I, I need to calm down. <laughs> um, it, it, you're at the edge of your seat. And I think he achieves that not only because the story is so intense, but because the music is so effective, because uh, the, the story is so dramatic. You've got three stories going on. You've got a story of what's going on in the beach and the efforts of two particular soldiers to get off the beach and to do whatever it takes to survive. It, it really is a story of survival and the obstacles and the disappointments and the catastrophes and the, and the bravery and the heroism and the, and the, and the cheating and, and, and the cowardice that all goes on when, when, when you've got hundreds of thousands of people who are trying to survive. And then you've got one story that happens on one of these boats, you know, uh, uh, sailed by a civilian heading towards war, not knowing what they're heading towards, but heading towards they, they know, you know, that the, the, the future of their country and therefore the future of their freedom depends on it. And they're sailing towards something. And then you've got a pilot who is one of the few pilots up in the air trying to protect the evacuation of Dunkirk um, from the, the, the Nazis' uh, air force and from, uh, uh, you know, from, from the, the, the air force just bombing the ships and bombing the beaches. And every one of these stories is anchored by incredible performances acting-wise. Very dramatic uh, situations. Now, you never get deep into the characters. The movie is not a character movie. The movie is almost an atmospheric movie. And the movie tries to place you there and make you feel like you're there. But it's not... You get a sense of characters, but you, you don't get much because it's, it's partially because the story's jumping within less than two hours between three different storylines. So you don't get to know any particular one of the people involved in those three storylines. Um, but, and it's not a, um, it's not a raw, raw heroism, you know, wonderful, everything is great movie. So it, it's definitely, it's definitely a movie about the horrors of war. It's definitely a movie about people being heroic in those horrors, but it underplays the heroism. And maybe that's a, I would say that's a criticism I have of the movie. It's definitely not romantic in that sense it's romantic in the sense that people are doing courageous heroic things and people are uh, applying their their their, their um, free will in, in pursuit of values but it, it, it doesn't it doesn't celebrate those values indeed when they reach home they are convinced that uh and, I, and i'm not giving away anything because there's no spoilers because it's an historical movie and you all know what happens but when they reach home um you know, the, 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 they are convinced that they have failed, right? They, they have lost to the Germans. And th they think that they are going to be booed and they're going to be spat on and they're going to be disrespected. And when they come home, they get the opposite response. People are celebrating and people are cheering them and so on. Um, and, and so it's got the sober mood to it. And then one of the big criticisms of the movie is Churchill gives a very famous speech. Um, uh, during this. I mean, maybe his most famous speech during World War II, and, and an amazing speech. Oh, we will fight them on the beaches. We will fight them here. And, you know, we will survive, and we will thrive, and we will do this. Um, and uh, it's a phenomenal speech, and to hear Churchill do it, or to hear an actor doing Churchill doing it is inspiring. But that's not the mood of the movie. The mood of the movie is very somber. So what it has is, it has the soldier reading it at the end on a train when he's in England and it's in the newspaper and he's reading it aloud. And I found it very powerful. I found it very poignant. You know, it, it's what it means to him. Yes, it's not a grand statement about saving Britain, but it's, it's much more personal and, it's, and, I, and I found it very meaningful. Anyway, I thought the movie, I enjoyed the movie and I would definitely go see it. Now, it's not, a, it's not a, and I think, I think the way he, ties in the three storylines. Pay attention to the three storylines. And pay attention to the, and I'm not going to give it away, pay attention to the titles, 
when they first come about, it says the beach one week, the boat or the ship one day, the plane or something like that, one hour. One hour, one day, one week. Pay attention to that, and you'll see how it all comes together at the end. It's, it's really, really, uh, it really is uh, quite, um, quite fascinating. Uh, and uh, I found the movie inspiring in spite of its kind of, kind of attempt to dull down our emotion, uh, our, our uh, you know, hero- uh, pro-heroism emotions. Um, I found it amazingly well integrated and, and, and a beautiful experience and very, very intense. So my, I was completely in the movie. I was completely drawn to it. I was com- so I would recommend it. it again, it, it's, and it, it, you know what it doesn't have, which I loved? It doesn't have gore. So it, it, you're completely at the edge of your seat. You're completely in suspense about people dying and how they're going to die and all of this. And there's no guts spilling out. And there's all blood squirting all over the place. It doesn't have that D-Day landing scene from Saving Private Ryan where people's guts are flowing out of them and all that. You don't need that to get at the horror of what their experience is. The mood is far more powerful. And this is what Hitchcock understood. It's far more powerful than showing you the, 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 the real savagery of war uh, and leaving the savagery implicit rather than explicit. Anyway, very powerful, uh, and I would, I, would, uh, I, would recommend, I would recommend seeing it. I'm, I'm interested to hear what, what you guys think of it. So uh, th- that is my review of Dunkirk, the movie. Let me give one.